So we're starting in on a new sermon series. We just wrapped up um, what I've kind of started to call the Gospel of Jonah last week. Um, we're starting in on a, new go- on a new sermon series this week based on the book of Titus. Titus? There's actually a book called Titus? Anybody know that? How often have you actually read Titus? I mean, Titus, to be honest, is kind of one of these books that, you know, it's probably, quite honestly, probably the least read letter or one of the least read letters in the New Testament. We just don't think a whole lot about it. It's, 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 It's one of the most forgotten, not just least read, but even one of the most forgotten. It's wedged, in between, um, it's wedged in between the letter of 2 Timothy and Philemon. And even though Philemon is one of those one-chapter books, just you know, a couple of verses long, we're actually more familiar with Philemon and what goes on there in the message of Philemon than we are with Titus. We just don't think about Titus. It gets relegated to the same place in our minds as 2 and 3 John. What is, what, what's in Titus? What's the deal with Titus? We just don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it or paying attention to it. So kind of by way of a brief description, Titus, Titus is a bit like cliff notes for First and Second Timothy. It's kind of a way, one way of kind of thinking about it. You remember, you know, maybe back in your college days, you know, maybe even in high school, if you actually knew about cliff notes, in, you know, in high school already, cliff notes, you know, you go to the, you go to Barnes and Noble or Borders, I mean, I don't even, Borders isn't even around anymore, but you go to a bookstore, you go and you pick up the cliff notes, you know, version of some topic or something like that, and it gives you a sense, you know, you kind of read through it and skim it and cramming as fast as you can before your final exam because, you know, you just want to get the basic idea. What is this book about? What is this novel about? I didn't actually read the novel. I've had four months to do it, but I didn't read it. I know none of you are never in that boat, right? So I got to go and I got to get cliff notes to figure out what is this actually about so I have something to say when I get to the final. And Titus is a little bit like cliff notes for First and Second Timothy. There's a lot of similarities between those two books. See, Titus was written by Paul to a man by the name of, you know, you guessed it, Titus. Um, kind of self, you know, self-explanatory there. So Titus, the man, was sent by Paul to the island of Crete as sort of a, a special missionary to the entire island. And the island's pretty good size. It's one of the biggest in the Mediterranean. It's about 160 miles or so long and about 60 miles wide. And, and Titus was actually commissioned with the job of you are going to be the pastor, the minister on Crete, the entire place. That, that, that's your entire parish. That's a big, that's a lot of ground to cover, a lot of ground to cover. And they were walking, so you know, there was no high-speed rail, no boats, no, well, they had boats, but no cars or anything like that. So he was walking everywhere, he had a lot of ground to cover. Paul himself, he did spend some time on Crete. Um, and we, kind of the sense we get from the Bible is that by the time Paul showed up, there was already a Christian community based and sort of, sort of you know, sprung up and established itself on Crete. So Paul did not plant that church there. He came, he showed up, and there were already Christians there. And we'll get a better picture of this, you know, of things, you know, as we kind of work through the letter, a better idea of what Crete was like. But one of the defining characteristics of these Cretan Christians is that their deeds, their lifestyle, it didn't quite line up with their faith. They would all sit here and say, yeah, we believe in Jesus. We believe he's the Messiah. We believe he's our Savior, and we, and we have faith in him. But they had a reputation for saying one thing and doing exactly the opposite. They had a reputation where I actually find out at one point, Paul flat out says, you know, Cretans Cretans are liars, and they admit it. They're all liars. Their lifestyle and their faith doesn't line up. And so a good chunk of this letter is about Paul instructing Titus on what needs to happen in order for these Cretan Christians to grow in their spiritual maturity, to something that Paul says involves both theological knowledge and deeds. So we'll also cover over the next couple of weeks, we'll also see over the next couple of weeks that part of the problem on Crete is that there was a group of people running around doing, doing their best to correct, so to speak, to correct the wrongs of Paul and Titus. These were teachers who were commonly referred to, or actually in, in, in this letter, that Paul refers to them simply as the circumcision group, a reference to this idea that there were a group of people running around who believed that you have to become Jewish in order to be Christian. You had to be a Jew first and go through all these Jewish rites, these Jewish ceremonies, these 
specifically the act of circumcision, in order to actually be saved and to be good with God. And it's a little bit ironic that Paul's selection of Titus to counter this circumcision group was in itself, you know, it, 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 was, it was irony, it was ironic in itself, or maybe even strategic in itself. It was a way for Paul proving that you did not have to be Jewish in order to be Christian. Because Titus, Titus, we read about this in Galatians chapter 2, Titus was a Greek himself who never felt any compulsion to go through the act of becoming circumcised and becoming Jewish. So here's Paul sending a Greek non-circumcised missionary to a group of people to counteract another group of people who are saying you have to be circumcised. Paul is almost in a sense, by sending Titus, he's saying you don't have to go through that. You can be Christian without that. Because really it's all about the gospel. Really it's about something else. So combine all of this with the reputation of the Cretans as people who are generally recognized as sort of untrustworthy and, and greatly lacking in the area of morality. And what we have in the letter of Titus, what we have is we have good news for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I really want to play that theme song, by the way. Okay. We tried. Didn't work. <laughs> Let's pray a second for God's leading, and then we're going to dig in to uh, the letter of Titus. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds, that we may be transformed, that we may be changed, that we may be moved and infected by your word, by the word that you spoke through Paul to Titus, that we ourselves may become new because of it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So Titus chapter 1 this morning. Titus chapter 1. I'm going to read. We're only going to look at a couple of verses this morning. The first couple, which is actually kind of the introduction to the letter of Titus, is just what we're going to spend our time on this morning. Um, then we're going to wrap up by celebrating communion down here and, and um, expressing our common faith, which is going to be a theme that we'll see woven throughout these verses in the entire book. Titus chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle, and and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. I'm actually going to stop there already. I'm going to stop there because this, this verse in and of itself is packed full of stuff. This is pretty typical Paul. What we see here in this first verse is pretty typical Paul. This is the way he typically starts his letters. If you look at other letters that he writes in the New Testament, he almost always starts off with this, with this introduction. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an apostle of Christ Jesus. See, Paul is bringing out something in this very first line. He's bringing out something unique about his call that applies to what he he is attempting to do throughout this entire letter. So this is really foundational. This is foundational stuff as we start to dig into this letter. The way he describes himself in these verses and these opening lines is intended to set a pattern of sorts for how he expects all believers to be and to act. So Paul, a servant of God, or I personally prefer the more literal re reading of a slave of God. Paul does this a lot. See, nobody, nobody wants to be a slave. Nobody wants to find themselves in a position of servitude. It seems almost kind of, you know, and, you know, the antithesis of everything that we are and everything we strive for and work for in life. See, to be a slave in our minds is to, is to have our humanity stripped away from us, forcing us and causing us to become something less than human. And in certain ways, in certain ways, that, that was true even during Paul's time. But there was also a type of hierarchy, so to speak, in, in, in the slave culture, in the slave community at this time also. You see, whose slave you were says something about your value as a slave or how valuable you were as a slave. It also says something about your specific job or vocation in life. So if you were the slave of a king, for example, that actually made you better than the slave of a wealthy landowner. 
In some cases, it might have actually made you better or more valuable than the wealthy landowner himself. Because you think about it, if you're the slave of a king, see, that wealthy landowner may never be invited into the king's presence, may never have the opportunity to be right there and in the midst of those conversations or be consulted for any reason or just simply be in the king's presence. But as a slave of a king, you were actually expected to be in the king's presence. You got something that the wealthy landowner would never get. So now think about what Paul is saying here a second. A slave of God. A slave of God. Not, not, not a wealthy landowner or businessman. Not a king, but God himself. This means that everything that Paul says and does and is is expected in many ways to reflect and to point back to his master, back to God himself. Because that was another thing that happens with slaves. If you're a slave of somebody, and when you go out in public, you're expected to give a good reputation for your master. And so Paul is here saying that I am a slave of God. Everything I do is expected to reflect and to point back to God. As a slave, Paul is not his own person. He is, he is God's person. He belongs to God. As a slave, he is, he's been called to kind of put aside his own preferences and desires and live entirely as God says he should. And that sounds dangerously close to legalism. I get that. I get that it sounds an awful lot like legalism to us in most of our years. But that's not really what I think Paul is saying here. Paul's not going to legalism. In fact, he argues frequently against legalism throughout his writings. In fact, what he's saying, what I think he's saying is when he's talking about being a slave to God, he doesn't see it as legalism. He sees it as grace. He sees this as an opportunity. It's not that I have to be, I have to do what God wants me to do. It's not that I have to be who God wants me to be. It's that I get to do what God wants me to do. I get to be who God wants me to be. Because God looks at me, he looks at you, And he sees somebody who is worthy to be his slave, to be his servant. It's the best grace, really, that a human could possibly hope for. You really think about it. So Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is someone who is sent someone who is sent. It assumes that an apostle is sent for a specific reason or a specific person. So Paul was sent by Jesus, which, which makes him pretty unique. Makes him pretty unique. So we, we are all apostles in our own right. We're all apostles in a certain way. But you know, we become apostles because we enter into this relationship with Christ. We have the Holy Spirit come inside us and dwell within us. And we are then empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we might call those, you know, spiritual gifts or it works its way out in spiritual gifts. And we are then sent out by the Spirit into the world to do certain work. But Paul is a little bit unique here in that he was not sent by the Holy Spirit. He was sent by Jesus himself for a specific specific reason. I mean, the differences might be kind of small, but there is enough of a difference to say that Paul was pretty special in this sense. He had been given a very special job to do. And so what was that job then? What was that job that he was sent to do? And this is where it really starts to connect with, um, with, the, with the letter of Titus, you know, where, where um, I'm getting all tripped up here. This is where it, it really starts to connect, I think, the stuff about being a slave and being an apostle with what the letter of Titus is about. And this is what Paul was sent to do, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. To further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. This is what Paul has been called to. And so in writing this letter, this is what he's seeking to accomplish to further the faith, to strengthen the faith of God's elect, to strengthen the faith of Christians, of believers. This is why Titus was sent to Crete. And now Paul is attempting to encourage and support Titus in his ministry there. That's what's going on here in this letter. So the question then is, how exactly is the faith furthered? If the whole point is to further the faith, how exactly is the faith furthered? And as Christians... Kind of part of the package is that we should have a never-ending longing to desire to further our faith, to strengthen and deepen and grow our faith. That should just kind of come with the package. It's par for the course. Especially if we think of our faith as a way of referring not just to our relationship with God, 
but also to the things that we do and the things that we know about God. See, typically speaking, we, we want to deepen our relationship. We want to grow and develop our relationship with our family members. So why would we not want to do this with, our, with God? So how exactly do we do that? Through knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So there's two parts here. First, that the knowledge of the truth. I know I'm really breaking this down into a lot of details, and there's a reason for that, and I'll get to that here in a minute. So Paul hasn't defined truth yet. Okay, he just says that this is something that needs to happen. You know, he hasn't defined truth yet. I'd be willing to bet and kind of, in some ways, kind of go out on a very, very safe limb here and say that, you know, based on everything that Paul has said, what Paul means when he talks about truth is he's talking about that reality, that, that, that message here that we are all sinners and that God, by his grace, sent his son to die on the cross that we might be reconciled to him and have eternal life. That's the truth for Paul, and everything he writes, everything he says, that is constantly the truth that he's looking to get us back to. Knowledge like that, the gospel message, knowledge like that changes a person. It completely transforms us. See, if your doctor tells you you have diabetes, what do you do? You go home, you change your diet, and you get on certain medications, you change your lifestyle, you make real, practical, tangible changes to what you do because of what you have. And yet, so often, for some reason, we find ourselves functioning as though knowledge of the gospel only has to go as far as our heart or our head, and it rarely makes its way all the way down to our fingers and our toes. If your knowledge of the truth doesn't have a total and complete lifestyle change with it, then according to the Bible, you don't really know that leads to the second part of what Paul is saying here. So knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And what is godliness? And don't say cleanliness, despite how some of you may have been raised and what you may have heard growing up. It's not cleanliness. That answer doesn't count in this context. Godliness, it's, uh, um, you know, translators put godliness in here. They translate the Greek here as godliness here because, well, frankly, it sounds more godly and more spiritual and it avoids some of the pitfalls of what the Greek is, is more, kind of more literally actually getting at. The translation, the Greek is more the idea of piety. And piety is one of those things that, you know, we kind of maybe kind of get kind of, you know, uncomfortable with sometimes. Piety refers to doing something out of duty or obligation. That does not necessarily mean that we don't do it willingly. It just means that what we do in doing something, the thing that we're doing has been prescribed as being right or proper. So let me bring all this together a second. So Paul is writing to Titus in order to encourage him in the work that he is doing on Crete and to strengthen and deepen the faith of the Cretans. And by extension, we are now benefiting from this letter also in order to deepen our faith. And in order to deepen our faith, we need both knowledge of the truth and to do what is right and proper. I know I'm spending a lot of time picking this one verse apart. I know that. I'm doing this in order to lay a good foundation for this entire study, for this entire book that we're going through. We're going to spend about six weeks, I think, on Titus. I'm doing this to lay down that foundation because much of what we will see in Titus will come across as legalistic or unrealistic legalism, I should say, if we don't temper it with the gospel. Much of the talk that goes around that we might be exposed to and hear takes the form of saying that the law is there and you do certain things, and by failing to do those things, that is how we become aware of our need for a Savior. Paul, in the letter of Titus, he comes at it from a different direction. He says that it's by our knowledge and transformation by the gospel that we find the motivation and the desire to bring our life, our piety in line with what we believe. So true faith generates real piety or godliness as it's referred to in Titus. So letter in Titus, for us then, it helps us to gain, a, get, a, get a better grasp of how our deeds, our actions are connected to the gospel. So verse two, 
in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, in which now at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the, impre- in, through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. So verse 1 Verse 1 tells us what Paul is up to. He tells us what the whole point of this is. Verse, verses 2 to 3, then, it gives us a sense of, I might say, in the sense of, of Paul's attitude. But even here, we can't just simply say that, that he's working to deepen our faith with hope that, that, that he, he has somehow, he has, to, he has to throw in some stuff about the sort of God that God is. And so here, he places a heavy emphasis on the fact that God does not lie but that he is faithful to the promises he has made. And what's more, he says that these promises were made before the beginning of time. That's a long time ago, right? A long time ago, before time even started. So why does Paul feel the need then to emphasize the fact that God doesn't lie? And that seems like kind of an odd thing to us. There's more translation stuff here. I mean, this is correct. It gets at the basic idea. But again, I like the Greek a lot better, the more literal Greek here a lot better in that. What it really gets at is this idea, the Greek literally reads, God who is free from deceit. It's not just that God, you know, a a promise that God doesn't lie. It's a promise that God is actually free from deceit. He does not deceive us. He is not deceptive. So one of the things that sets God apart from the other gods at the time, you know, who were going around Crete, the hundreds, maybe thousands of other gods that people on Crete would have worshipped, is that God, or all those other gods, those Cretan gods, they were extremely fickle. You really didn't know what they were going to want from one day to the next. You know, they were kind of moody, like Jonah. Remember Jonah, how moody he was, now back and forth he was? The gods of Crete were a lot like that themselves. And one day they would say, one day I want you to offer this, or I'm demanding this sacrifice from you. And the next day it was something completely different that was completely unrelated to the one that came the day before that. What made it even more difficult is because there were so many gods, is that you could, you could offer a sacrifice to one god that might get you in hot water with another god. So maybe one day you offer a sacrifice and you're blessed with good health, but because another God who had a beef with that first God didn't like that you were worshiping that first God, that God is going to say, no, I'm going to burn your house down. You might be healthy, but now you don't have a house to live in. That was this constant fear and back and forth that these people were wrestling with and living in. And then along comes God. Along comes God, the God of the Bible. And now we scoff at that and we think to ourselves, you know, who would want to worship God or gods like that? I mean, that's ridiculous. But honestly, you ever find yourself wondering when God's other shoe is going to drop? You ever find yourself thinking, well, things have been going so great right now and they're so perfect and everything we need and want, everything is falling into place. The only good logical explanation for this is that, well, something else has got to be coming. God's got to be building up to something. And the only reason we're getting these things is that we have enough to sustain us through that next trial. You ever find yourself kind of thinking that and wrestling with that? And not all of us are going to wrestle with that. Not all of us are going to be there, but I'd be willing to bet that there's at least a couple of us here that do wrestle with that. Maybe you're wrestling with that right now. Maybe you wrestle with that at some point in your life. You know, all this spiritual gift stuff that I've been going through lately with this class on Sunday night and everything else, my faith is actually really high. But I've had moments, despite faith being a strong spiritual gift of mine, I've had moments where I doubt. And I think there's no way that this can be this good. This is too good to be true. You wrestle with that. You struggle with that and with having that confidence of whether or not what God has promised and seems to be promising you is really going to play out. And here we have Paul emphasizing the Titus as something, sort of, you know, that first thing, that first thing in that whole idea of spiritual growth and furthering our faith, that first thing being don't forget God is free of deceit. God does not lie. He's faithful. He has made promises before time began, and he will stick to it and carry it out. Do not doubt that. That's what all those other gods do. Those other gods, they change their mind. God does not change his mind. He does not lie. He has promised eternal life. He has promised to bless his people. And by golly, he will make good on those promises. Verse 4, to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. 
So by true faith, Paul is not, or by true son, Paul is not talking about a biological son. Paul wasn't married. Um, these all indications that he wasn't married. He didn't have kids. He's talking about a spiritual son. He's talking about a really true son. Paul, at some point during his ministry, he, he met Titus, he ran to Titus, he led Titus to accept the gospel, and he discipled Titus to grow in his faith. And now he's sending Titus out to do the same for somebody else. Titus... Titus is, a, is, is gospel for the good, the bad, and the ugly, and everyone in between. That's a reality of the letter of Titus. It's gospel for everyone. Grace and peace are the two central blessings of the gospel. Those are the two central blessings of the gospel of the cross. See, the gospel promises grace to those who believe. The gospel itself is a product of God's grace to us, to the world. Peace is a result of the gospel. Or peace is a result of grace. Peace between us and all, of our, and all of our imperfection and a holy, just, and righteous God. The gospel promises peace there. And by transformation of the gospel and a renewed heart, we learn to truly love even one another also. So it's not just a promise of peace between us and God. It's a promise of peace between us and someone else, person to person. It's a promise that between us and in our own interactions, we will experience grace and peace from one another and also from God. See, in a minute, I'm going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And this is one place, this is one act, one event in which those ideas of grace and peace come together, are sort of unique, are sort of you know, um, uh, united and combined. See, it's, this is the place where, a place where the knowledge of the truth and where godliness, piety are joined is at this table. See, in some circles, this is sometimes referred to as a Eucharist, a word that, an old Latin word, old Latin phrase that, that, that focuses on and tries to draw out the grace that is taking place at this table and in these elements and that we are reminded of here. In other places, we sometimes refer to this as communion, a word that emphasizes the fact that we are somehow mysteriously joined with God, but also joined with one another as we participate and partake of these elements. And that is something that can only happen if grace and peace really are present. Grace and peace as that never-ending, everlasting promise from God. 